All right, pause the video here for a couple of minutes and try to name the following compounds. Okay, so um, remember when we're naming compounds, the first thing we need to do is determine if the compound is ionic or covalent because depending on the answer to that question, we're going to have to use a different set of rules. So um, th the way that we determine whether a compound is ionic or covalent is by seeing if it's a metal and a nonmetal, which is ionic, or a nonmetal and a nonmetal, which is covalent. So in this case, we have a sodium atom and a fluoride atom. Sodium is a metal, um, element number 11 on the periodic table here. So um, sodium is a metal, so that means that this is a metal, non-metal compound. This is an ionic compound. Um, and for ionic compounds, we name them by um, naming first the cation, and then we name the anion. So remember, the name of the cation is the same as the name of the element. So this element is called sodium, so the cation is called sodium. So naming the cation is generally pretty easy. So to name the anion, we start with the name of the element, which in this case is fluorine, and then we uh, drop the ending, the I-N-E in this case, and we add I-D-E. So fluorine becomes fluoride. So we would start by writing sodium fluorine, and then we drop the ending, oops, and we add I, D, E. So sodium fluorine becomes sodium fluoride. All right, let's do the next one. So um, we find these elements in the periodic table. Rubidium is right here. It's in the same column. It's an alkali metal, just like sodium. And oxygen is over here. So this is a metal and a non-metal. So this is an ionic compound. So we name the cation first, and then we name the anion. The cation has the same name as the element, and the name of this element is rubidium. And then we have oxygen. So uh, to name an anion, the name of the anion is not the same as the element. We start with the el element as the base, and then we uh, drop the ending, just like we did with fluorine. So in this case, we drop this whole piece here, Y-G-E-N. Now, it's difficult to make a rule about what the ending is that you drop off, because depending on the specific element, it's always, kind of, it's always a little bit different what the ending is that you drop off. So it helps to look at a table of anions so that you can see, um, for example, sulfur becomes sulfide and phosphorus becomes phosphide. It's hard, uh, you can't really make a rule to say how many letters you're supposed to drop off. So we remove the ending here, the Y-G-E-N in the case of oxygen, and we add the same ending that we did before, I-D-E. So rubidium oxygen becomes rubidium oxide, and that's the name of this ionic compound. Notice that it doesn't matter that there's a 2, the subscript of the 2 in there. That does not, if it's an ionic compound, we don't bother with subscripts. All we have to do is name the cation and the anion. So let's do the next one. Find the elements in the periodic table. B, B is up here. It's a metalloid. It's not a metal. So we uh, can't use the ionic the rules for ions because this is not an ionic compound. Boron here is a metalloid, 
and chlorine is a nonmetal. So this compound is a covalent compound. So the set of rules that we have to use to name covalent compounds is a little bit different. We still have to name each element. So that's the same. So we'll start with the first element. It's called boron. So we're starting out pretty much the same here. We, we name the first element. When we name the cation, it's named the same as the element. And here, when I name the first element, it also has the same name as the element. Um, the second uh, element is chlorine. So we're going to drop the ending just like we would if it was ion, an ion. And then we're going to add the suffix I, D, E. Boron chloride. It's looking pretty similar so far. So the difference, here comes the difference. When this is a covalent compound and it's not an ionic compound, now I do care about the subscript. So there's no subscript after B. I assume that B is 1. It would be B1. If there's a 1 there, then we don't draw it. We assume that it's 1. Um, but there's a 3 after the chlorine. So I do have to use, I have to put that 3 in the name. So BCL3, that 3 is called tri. And tri goes in front of the second element. Well, it goes in front of whichever element uh, has the three. So tri will go in front of the chloride, the chloride because there are three. There's a subscript of three after the chlorine atom. So this is a complete name for this compound, boron trichloride. All right, let's do the next one. Okay, eight, let's find these elements on the periodic table. H is up here. Even though it's to the left of this zigzag, line that separates the metals from the nonmetals. It is not a metal. See, it's green, just like the nonmetals. just happens to be over here on the left side of the table. So um, hydrogen is a nonmetal, so this is a covalent compound. Hydrogen and selenium over here, nonmetal. So this is a covalent compound. And when H comes first, it's a special kind of covalent compound that we call an acid. And acids have uh, different rules to name them. So when we're naming this acid, we have to name the first element first. So this is looking pretty similar to hydrogen. But when it's an acid, when the hydrogen comes first, I drop the GEN. So it just becomes hydro. Now I have to put the name the second element. Selenium. And we drop the IUM ending. And what's an acid that only has two elements like this, hydrogen and selenium, and I add I C hydroselenic acid. All right, let's do this next one. We find the elements in the periodic table. P is over here, and O. So over here, they're both non-metals, so this is a covalent compound. 
So we have to use the set of rules for naming covalent compounds. So we start with this first element. We call it phosphorus. And the second element is oxygen. I need more space. And the second element is oxygen. So now, since this is a covalent compound, we have to name those subscripts. Four is called tetra. So tetra goes in front of phosphorus, one word, tetraphosphorus. And six is hexa. But when it's, when I have two vowels in a row, A and O, like this, it would be hexa oxide. And um, that doesn't sound quite right, so we drop the A. So it becomes hex. Remember, on the second element, we have to drop the ending. So oxygen becomes ox. Hide. So we name the first element phosphorus and name the subscript. Four is tetra, tetraphosphorus, and then we name the second element oxygen and drop that ending so it becomes oxide, and there are six of those, so hexoxide, tetraphosphorus hexoxide. All right, let's do the last one here, ICl3. I is right here, Cl is right here, so those are both nonmetals. So the first one is iodine, and the second one is chlorine. So on the second element, we drop the ending. So chlorine becomes chloride. And we have to uh, name the prefix or the subscripts. The, it, for I, there's a subscript of one, so we don't have to put anything in front there. For CL, there's a subscript of three, so I have to write tri. Iodine trichloride, just like boron trichloride, just change, changing the name of the first element. Okay, go ahead and pause the video here for a couple of minutes and give this one a shot. Okay, write the formulas of the following compounds. Lithium carbonate. So lithium, bring up the table here. Lithium is Li, and carbonate is one of those polyatomic ions. So we would look that up on a table. Carbonate is CO3. Now when we're writing a chemical formula, it's important to write in the um, charges. So CO3 has a 2 minus charge, and Li has a plus charge. So remember, when I'm trying to join these together, their charges have to cancel out. So in order for the charge here to be zero, I need two lithiums to balance that negative two charge on carbonate. So when I bring these together, I have two lithiums and one carbonate. It would be Li2CO3. All right, let's just go down this column here. Barium 
is B A two plus and hydroxide that's another polyatomic O H minus so when I bring these two together B A OH, I can do a switcheroo. The two would go down here, and the one subscript would go down here, so it becomes BA1OH2. I need two hydroxides. So if I need two of a polyatomic ion, I have to put the polyatomic in parentheses, put the two on the outside. BaOH2. All right, sulfuric acid. When an acid does not have hydro in front of it, then that doesn't mean that it doesn't contain hydrogen. It still contains hydrogen as the first element. Sulfuric acid still has hydrogen as the first element, even though it doesn't start with hydro. When it doesn't start with hydro, what that tells us is that it contains a polyatomic ion. In this case, um, to work backwards from the name, if I add IC acid to something, ic acid, to um, a polyatomic and oxy acid with a polyatomic anion, then that means that the polyatomic anion has the ending A-T-E. A-T-E turns into I-C acid. So in this case, um, if I were to work backwards, it would be sulfate becomes sulfuric acid. So this compound contains the polyatomic ion, sulfate, SO4, 2 minus. And it's an acid, so it also contains hydrogen as the first element. All acids contain hydrogen as the first element, H+. So when I write these two elements together, H and the anion, or the other half at least, SO4, and I put these two pieces together, um, I need to balance the charge. So if I do the switcheroo here where the, the charges become the subscripts, And that shows me that I need a 2, a subscript of a 2 for hydrogen, two hydrogens. And SO4, the subscript for SO4 should be 1 because the charge on H is plus 1. So if I only have one of those SO4 units, I don't have to put parentheses because the 1 is already implied. So sulfuric acid, H2SO4. Magnesium phosphate. Magnesium is Mg2 plus. Phosphate is PO4 3 minus. That's another one of those polyatomics. So all polyatomics on this side. So um, if I bring these together, MgPO. Or, and I do the switcheroo, it shows me that I need two, I'm not going to draw the arrows this time, you guys know what I'm doing. The magnesium, the two from the magnesium becomes the subscript for phosphate. So I need to put phosphate in parentheses to put the two over there. And the charge for phosphate, three minus, becomes the subscript for magnesium, three so I put that 3 right here. And I'm going to move this to the other side. Sodium. Here's sodium. Sodium has a plus 1 charge. So I, I, I guess I skipped over that part for these others. But remember, sodium is here. 
So all the elements that are in this column always get a plus one charge. And all the elements that are in this column always get a plus two charge. So here's lithium, it had a plus one. Barium, plus two. Here's barium. Uh, hydrogen, plus one in this column. Magnesium, plus two in this column. So I can figure out what the charge on that element is by placing it in either the orange column or the yellow column here. Okay, sodium. Sodium right here. And I think that's smaller. And a plus per chlorate that's polyatomic clo4 minus one so the charges have to be balanced in this case i have a plus one and a minus one so they are balanced when i just have one of each ion so when i bring them together is nacl4 Ammonium carbonate. Ammonium looks like this, NH4 plus. And carbonate is CO3 2 minus. So when I bring these together, I'll leave myself enough room here. I'm going to need two ammoniums. So I put ammonium in parentheses and put a two here and one carbonate because the carbonate has a minus two charge and the ammonium has a plus one charge. So I need two of those plus ones to get to plus two. And the way to indicate that I have two ammoniums is to put ammonium in parentheses and put the two on the outside. Calcium, that's right here, calcium, which means it's plus two. Acetate, acetate looks like this, C2H3O2 minus one. So when these come together, I need two acetates. Because acetate has a minus one charge and calcium has a plus two. So when I have two of these, then I have minus two plus two and that would equal zero. So I put the acetate in parentheses and put the two on the outside. All right, last one, sodium sulfite. Sodium. So we already saw sulfate on the other side from sulfuric acid. And remember, sulfate is SO42 minus. So when I see this 8 ite sulfate sulfite, the A-T-E ending indicates that it has more oxygen atoms. So sulfate has more, and sulfite has one fewer. So sulfate is SO4, and sulfite is SO3, 2 minus. So when sodium and sulfite come together, I need two sodiums, Na2, and one sulfite, SO3. So we saw this one over here, phosphate. So what does phosphite look like? PO3, 3 minus. And nitrate, NO3. What does nitrite look like? Nitrite is N. O2. It has one fewer.